Well, good evening. It's uh, good to see you all here again. We welcome each one of you. And uh, to those of you watching Sunday morning, we welcome you as well online. It is good to meet together. Uh, I've been thinking about our my, my personal uh, extended family in BC and still hearing that they have no services out there. So I'm so grateful that we can meet even though we are a small group. And I know many of us were, were hoping for some news of a, a bigger venue for, for this week, but um, uh, that unfortunately did not work out. So um, we're very grateful uh, for the work that the elders are doing, uh, trying to find a, a more suitable location. So um, I just want to assure you that they are working diligently trying to find something that will be uh, good for the whole congregation. So uh, we'll just uh, be patient and thank the Lord for what we have. And uh, we'll stay tuned for, for more news to come. This uh, week, we, um, we again have the privilege of celebrating many birthdays in our congregation. We have uh, Lil Payne tomorrow, so happy birthday. On uh, Monday, we have Matt Ferguson and Vanessa Stewart. On Tuesday, Emily Peterson, happy birthday. And then uh, later in the week, we have Annie Pryor on the 11th and Jamie Pryor on the 13th. So happy birthday to you as well. We're grateful to have you in our, in our uh, congregation. For our uh, call to worship, I'd like to actually read the passage that we are uh, doing for the, the verses of the month. Uh, we don't have the little cards in front of you, uh, but if you want to open your Bibles, um, or if you have the bulletin printed up, it is uh, Mark 10, verses 43 to 45. Mark 10, 43 to 45. And I'm going to actually read uh, the section before you, and this is in the ESV. So I'm going to read from verse 35, and then I'll have you join in at uh, 43. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with, with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and, they, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Let's read the verses of the month together. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for these words. We can identify with uh, these disciples who, who hoped for more out of your kingdom, who thought in earthly terms and uh, wanted to be recognized, wanted to be great. And yet, Father, what an example. You were sending your son to a humble manger where he was born and lived a human life and yet lived a perfect life and then died for us. Father, thank you that Christ came as a humble servant, as an example to us, but also as that perfect sacrifice. So we thank you that we can celebrate this together as we come together to worship. We pray that you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us tonight. And Father, we do also pray that you would humble us, that you would make us more like your Son. So we thank you for this time together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Good to see you once again. For our scripture reading tonight, please turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. Uh, We're getting in our studies in the book of Romans into a section dealing with uh, the wrath or judgment of God. And so what I thought, um, just in my own private uh, Bible reading, uh, part of my my reading regimen is, is taking me through Isaiah. And it does seem to be in Isaiah that he pictures what God's judgment will be like uh, not only upon the people who are judged, but its impact on those, uh, uh, on the remnant of believers as well. And so I thought there in some ways is a good tie uh, from Isaiah into the book of Romans. And we'll be able to, in, in some ways in succeeding weeks to go through both uh, at the same time. So let's, let's begin reading together from Isaiah chapter 24, and we'll read the entirety of the chapter. This is the word of the Lord. Behold, the Lord lays the earth waste. He devastates it, distorts its surfaces, and scatters its inhabitants. And the people will be like priests, the servant like his master, the maid like her mistress, the buyer like the seller, the lender like the borrower, the creditor like the debtor. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. He, the exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. The new, the, the new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry-hearted sigh, the gaiety of tambourines ceases, the noise of revelers stops, the gaiety of the harp ceases. They do not drink wine with, with song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The city of chaos is broken down. Every house is shut up so that none may enter. There is an outcry in the streets concerning the wine. All joy turns to gloom. The gaiety of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city, and the gate is battered to ruins. For thus it will be in the midst of the earth among the peoples. As the shaking of the olive tree, as the gleanings when the grape harvest is over, they raise their voices, they shout for joy, they cry out, from the west concerning the majesty of the Lord. Therefore glorify the Lord in the east. In the name of God, the God of Israel, in the coastlands of the sea, from the ends of the earth, we hear songs, glorify, glory to the righteous one. But I say, woe to me, woe to me, alas for me. The treacherous deal treacherously, the treacherous deal tre- very treacherously. Terror and and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in the snare. For the windows above are open, and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently, the earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a, like a shack, for its transgressions is heavy upon it, and it will fall, never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth, and they will be gathered together like prisoners in, in the dungeon. And they will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be abashed, and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign. He will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. This is the word of the Lord. Let's receive it as such. Thank 
have the privilege of uh, spending some time in prayer together as a church family. And uh, I do want to highlight a few um, prayer items or a few items that, that uh, come to my attention. Um, Bill Martin, uh, it sounds like uh, I heard that he fell, I think today, uh, trying to clear snow off of his car, so he injured himself. Apparently it's the second time, so we're going to just pray for him, for, for uh, healing on his body, for comfort for him. And then also, uh, I've been told that Vic um, uh, Berg is still in Red Deer. For those who don't know, he's uh, receiving treatment after the stroke that he had some months ago, but he's still out in Red Deer. So I'd like to pray for himself and for Vi as they're apart. Um, so let's uh, bow together in prayer. Our graciously, gracious Heavenly Father, what a comfort it is to um, come before you to cast our cares before you, knowing that you are a God who hears and cares. Lord, I, I just uh, thank you that we can uh, bring concerns to you. Uh, we thank you for our members. And uh, even though we can't all meet together, we know that you are with uh, very near to each one of them. And so it gives us great comfort to know that you are in the midst of each uh, household in our, in our congregation, and that because of that, we are united together because your Holy Spirit lives in them and in us. So, Father, we, we do want to lift up to you, Vic and Vi. We uh, pray for continued healing and for care for the doctors as they take care of Vic in Red Deer. And we ask for special comfort for Vi as she's here. Just pray that you would fill her days with encouragement from you and from others. Just commit them into your hands. And, Father, for Bill, we... Uh, we just ask that you would be especially near to him tonight, that as, as he's miss, missing this service that he so faithfully attends, we pray that you would encourage him. And Lord, that uh, he would just see your working even in these difficult times. Lord, I pray that uh, love, uh, friends would reach out to him even there in Troshu, and that you would quickly bring him back to good health so that he can uh, join us again. Lord, we do want to thank you, too, for each of these members in our congregation that are celebrating uh, their birthdays this week, for Lil and Matt, Vanessa, Emily, Annie, and uh, Jamie. Lord, what a blessing it is to have all of these people in our congregation. We know that you personally uh, ordained for them to each be uh, in our congregation and, and uh, that we would be a family together supporting one another, uh, encouraging one another, and challenging one another. And so I pray for them, uh, for each one of them in this week, that you would encourage them, that most of all you would be doing your uh, sanctifying work in them and uh, continuing to draw them to yourself. So we thank you so much for them. Lord, we do uh, want to uh, also thank you for our elders and the hard work they're doing trying to uh, find suitable facilities for us as a church. We do pray for uh, patience for all of us. And uh, Lord, we do look forward to the day when we can meet in a, in a greater number. And so we do ask for your uh, work intervening uh, and providing us a place where we can meet as a, as a larger congregation. But until that day, we, we are grateful for what you have allowed us. We thank you that in this province we can meet in smaller groups. And we pray that we would do that in a way that honors and glorifies you. We do pray for the other churches in our community as well and in our country. Father, that, um, that you would do a strengthening among the believers, that, that they would, in these times when they're, they're apart, that they would not stray from you and grow lukewarm, but Father, that you would strengthen them, that this uh, time of uh, restrictions would not be wasted, but, Father, that you would use it to refine us as your people. So we do thank you for what you're going to do during these times. And, Lord, we do pray as well for our uh, government leaders as they're navigating all these uh, issues and the pressures they feel from every side. Would you give them wisdom and uh, the uh, courage to do uh, what is best, Father, and help us to be accepting as well. Lord, we, uh, we thank you uh, again for this time together, and I want to um, echo the words of, of uh, the Psalmist David in, in the 25th chapter. He says, Good and upright is the Lord, 
Therefore, you instruct sinners in the way. You lead the humble in what is right and teach the humble your way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep your covenant and your testimonies. So, Father, we do pray that for us now, as you teach us from your word, as Dave comes uh, to, uh, to open the scriptures for us, would you teach us, Father? Would you humble us? Would you open our hearts to receive the message you have for us? We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks very much, Calvin. What does God look like in your own mind's eye? Uh, if you could build your own uh, user-friendly model, uh, what, would he, what would he look like? Uh, with remarkable candor, Chuck Swindoll answers that question, and this is what he writes. He says, if I were to make up my own God, he would be a lot like one of the Holly, like, like the one Hollywood depicts in its movies. I would like him to be a cigar chomping, delightfully witty curmudgeon who who keeps me laughing. Or, or better yet, he could be a, a serene butler-like character who who keeps me out of trouble with wisdom greater than my own, yet serves me nonetheless. The God I would make for myself would be kindly and firm, but take a, a boys will be boys stance when I do. After all, the negative consequences of my poor, decision, poor decisions are punishment enough, right? Then turning the tables, he continues. He says, what kind of God do you worship? Is he or she a designer God? Is he or she merely an imaginary higher power who possesses all the admirable qualities missing from your own close relationships? Or is he or she an, an immensely powerful depiction of the character, character, character traits you fear most, like jealousy, rage, petty, nitpicking, or passive-aggressive guilt? Do you worship the God of your imagination or the one who actually exists? It's a profound question. It's a question that must be answered honestly, particularly in light of the passage that we're going to be studying this evening. This morning we're going to be confronted by an image of God that is not very appealing to the modern mind we'll discover that God is a wrathful God. The idea of a wrathful God cuts against the, the wishful thinking of fallen man. It's become a, a stumbling block, an offense, an, an odiferous doctrine, even amongst many believers. Many who call themselves Christians would, would have us to focus on the, on the positive. Uh, let's, uh, let's consider... Uh, the joy of salvation. Let's skip over all that other stuff. And just emphasize instead the blessings of our new life in Christ, our, our hope for the future. And yet that is something we cannot do. Because as believers, we must follow the, the example of the Apostle Paul uh, and, and preach the whole counsel of God. Uh, we cannot shy away from these doctrines we, we, because in doing so we deny God's holiness. We, uh, we disregard the teachings of Scripture. We cheapen uh, Christ's sacrifice and our salvation. It, it undermines the need for evangelism. And so as, as distasteful as it may be, we must give ourselves to this study and submit ourselves to this study. Well, recognizing the importance and interconnectedness of divine truth, how one doctrine plays off another, Paul starts his gospel presentation by demonstrating how God's righteousness is displayed in the condemnation of sinful man. 
Because God is a righteous and holy God. He cannot turn a blind eye to man's sin. He must deal with it. And he does so through his wrath. And so Paul begins presenting the, uh, by presenting the bad news in order to emphasize the need and the necessity of the good news of the gospel. And with that in mind, let's open our Bibles and turn once again to Paul's epistle, his letter to the Romans, and turn to chapter 1. This evening we're going to focus our attention on verses 18 through 23. 18 to 23. Uh, these verses really introduce the first main section of, of Paul's uh, epistle. Uh, his theme in this section is the uh, the revelation of God's righteousness in the condemnation of sinful man. And it will begin at verse 18, so Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and it will extend all the way uh, to the end of Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, his treatment in this section moves from the general to the specific and then back to the general again. Uh, he will begin by focusing on God's wrath in, in our present section or our, our present text, uh, focusing on God's wrath against humanity itself. Then in subsequent uh, divisions, he'll concentrate on God's wrath against the hedonists against the hypocrite, and then the Hebrew. And then he will wrap it up, uh, demonstrating that there is none righteous, not even one. So having given you a broad overview of our, this section, let's stand for the reading of this evening's passage. Let's read Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, and continue to the end of verse 23. Let's read together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understand through that which has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God, or did they give Him thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the word. Let's, let's bow together. Father, knowing that the human heart is deceitful above all things, we, we cry out for help this evening. We cry out that rather than brushing aside the text, you would help us to be attentive to it. That you would help us understand what it says concerning your character, concerning your revelation to us. Father, help us to understand the implications for us as a body of believers uh, living in a, a sin-sick world. And in doing so, we ask that you would help us to give you all the honor and glory you are due. We pray this in the precious name of your, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. Paul's essential message in our passage, our big idea for this evening, is relatively straightforward. God's righteous wrath is being revealed against all, all mankind, all who suppress the truth. I'll say that again. God's righteous wrath is being revealed against all who suppress the truth. 
the Apostle conveys this message really in two parts. He begins by giving us the proposition in verse 18, and then follows that up with his rationale in verses 19 to 23. So he begins by telling us what is happening, and then follows up uh, in subsequent verses by telling us why that is happening. So our proposition is, is presented to us in verse 18, and it's simple. God's wrath is being poured out on all man, all humanity. Uh, look again at the text. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. It, it's safe to say, I think, that verse 18 is the key text for the entire section. Uh, it, it's the umbrella verse. Uh, everything that comes after, from verse 19 all the way to the end of, of Romans chapter 3, verse 20, uh, unpacks or explains this particular verse. Uh, and so if we're going to understand what Paul is expressing in this particular section, we really need to give careful attention to what he is saying here. You know, typically when we think of wrath, when we speak of wrath, uh, we envision some violent, uh, uncontrollable outburst. We, we picture someone blowing their staff. Uh, they become a, an, evo uh, an emotional volcano, uh, spewing hot lava this way and that, uh, heedless uh, of, of who it touches, of who it scorches. It burns everything and everyone in its path. And yet we need to recognize that that is not the picture that's presented here. Uh, Greek really uses two words to express the, either the wrath of God or, or the wrath of man. Uh, the first term that it uses is, is often thumos. It's the term from which we get the word um, thermos or thermometer or thermite. Uh, thermite is a, a chemical compound uh, which uh, burns hot enough uh, around 2200 to 2500 degrees Celsius, uh, sometimes used in uh, welding. It, it can burn right through steel. Uh, it is often used as, as part of explosive devices as, as well. And so the term, which we have borrowed, refers to that emotional explosion. Uh, it's that red-hot anger that causes that mild-mannered individual uh, to, to lose all sense, uh, leading to you know, them punching someone in the nose. It's just uncontrollable, unbridled um, rage. It's impulsive. And yet that's actually not the word that's used here. Instead, Paul speaks of God's wrath, of God's orge. Uh, the term itself speaks of an individual's fierce but settled indignation. Uh, this person does not fly off the handle. No, they remain in control, in a controlled, uh, abiding condition. We really see a picture of this uh, modeled in Genesis chapter 6 and 7. Uh, during the days of Noah, uh, God saw that the, the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. And so in his wrath, his righteous judgment, God determined to blot man out from the face of the earth. Well, how did he do that? He did that by calling a specific individual, a man named Noah, to build an ark. He commissioned him to, to be a, uh, a, a preacher of righteousness, calling people to repent. And then, not after a short while, but after a century, perhaps even longer, after a century, God then opened up the floodgates. While God's anger is hot, it's not rash. It's not impetuous or indiscriminate. 
But I want you to notice something else about God's wrath, particularly in Paul's text. It is a constant wrath. The text says that God's wrath is revealed, not that it has been revealed. It's the, the, the verb tense here is in the, the present tense, indicating that this is an ongoing practice, a practice that is evident even today. God's wrath is personal. It comes from heaven. Uh, meaning that it, it is by God. Uh, that God's punishment is not a matter of, of random chance. It's deliberate. It's purposeful. Finding its source in Him. Uh, this wrath is targeted. It's directed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. And since all men and women and boys and girls fail to reverence God, which is the meaning of ungodliness, and since all men and all women and all boys and all girls rebel against God's righteous standard, which is the sense of unrighteousness, what we find here is that God's wrath is also universal. It means that all people, regardless of sex or age or skin color, all of them are subject to God's just judgment. All of them, regardless of their family ties, their religious upbringing, uh, their economic or political or social status, all of them will face and are facing God's fierce and righteous indignation. This judgment is universal. There are no exception. Why is that? Because every human being has taken upon themselves to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Paul goes on then to explain this idea in the remainder of our text this evening. See, he wants us to understand that man is guilty of a cosmic crime, that they are suppressing the truth. But what truth is that? It's the truth that God has revealed concerning Himself in and through creation. Observe what Paul says in verses 19 and 20. We're told that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which has been made, so that they are without excuse. Paul tells us here that God has revealed something of Himself through creation. Uh, theologians call this general or natural revelation. And unlike special revelation, which refers to uh, the Scriptures or a prophetic utterance, uh, that which is limited to a few people, uh, living in a specific place at a particular point in time, uh, general revelation or natural revelation is far more broad. Uh, general re revelation refers to that divine communication that is available to all people in all places at all times. And creation is a form of that kind of general revelation. God has used it to communicate something of his person and his power. The psalmist understood this well. He, he writes a thousand years before the Apostle Paul, and this is what he, David, says in Psalm 19, in verses 1 through 6. He says, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there any words where his voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of its chamber. It, it rejoices as a strong man to run its course. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit is all the way to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Make no mistake about it. All of creation is designed to tell something, uh, to tell us something about the Creator. 
that we contemplate the vastness of space, the height of the Rocky Mountains, the, the depth of the sea, and we marvel at God's immense power. When we gaze upon the various species of birds or animals, we're awed by his creativity. Uh, when we observe the cellular structure of, of an onion or, or a blade of grass under a microscope, we're informed that God is a God of order and structure. When we consider the complexity of, of various bodily functions, just of how the blood clots when we get a cut, we're confronted by the fact that our God is an intelligent designer. The flowers tell us that God is, is a God who enjoys beauty. The rising of the sun, the setting of the moon, the, the season themselves speak of his consistency. They remind us that not only is he our creator, but he is our sustainer. Uh, the rain that falls, the crops that grow, the fruit that ripens on the vine, they all declare that our God is a generous God, one who cares for his subject. John Calvin, the great Genevan reformer, points to the significance of such things. He writes this, he says, Man was created to be a spectator of this formed world. Eyes were given to him so that he might, by looking at so beautiful a picture, be led to the author himself. Now look back at our text. Creation reveals God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. But did you notice the manner in which these things are presented? Verse 19 demonstrates that God's self-revelation is conspicuous. It's not hidden. It's not tucked away in some sort of secret compartment. Hidden away in some lair. No, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. It shines forth. It is readily apparent. At 19 months of age, Helen Keller contracted disease, a disease that robbed her of her sight, her hearing, and her speech. And she, so she became deaf, uh, deaf, uh, blind, and, and mostly mute. Through the tireless efforts of Ann Sullivan, her nurse, uh, Keller was taught how to communicate through touch. When Miss Sullivan first tried to tell Helen about God, the girl's response was emphatic. She said she already knew him. She just didn't know his name. The revelation of God in and through creation is conspicuous. It is, it is, it is apparent to all people. It's conspicuous. So much so that even a blind person can see it. Next, we also see that God's revelation is constant. The person and power of God has been made known since the creation of the world. Notice how Paul does not simply say that God's invisible attributes have been manifest or, or were manifest at the creation of the world. By itself, that would be a true statement. However, what Paul is getting at here is that God's testimony concerning himself, not only did it begin at the dawn of time, but it has continued to pour forth day after day, night after night. So when the unsaved individual stands before the great white throne, they will not be able to say, I never got the message. Or, or you can't hold me guilty because I never received the call. No, creation is the billboard that's plastered alongside every roadside. It's the siren that never stops screeching. It is constant. It is continuous. His revelation is also clear. Midway through verse 20, Paul tells us that this message has been clearly seen. It has been understood. Uh, no one can look at, at the night sky and claim that there is no God. Uh, Johannes Kepler, uh, the famous astronomer, he, he understood this well, claiming that 
the devout astronomer is mad. They're psychotic. Because when they look at the night sky, they can't explain it by any other cause but by God himself. His signature is written across the heavens. His fingerprints are found on every tree trunk, every store, every thunderclap sings his praises. The testimony of God's created order is so conspicuous, it's so constant, it's so clear that mankind is without excuse. And so this revelation is a convicting revelation. Man has been confronted by the evidence. The record of God's presence has been put on public display for all to see. That testimony has never been muted. The show has never been canceled. It continues to play over and over and over and over again. And yet despite all the signs and proofs of God's existence, humanity has continued to ignore the truth. Worse yet, he has suppressed that truth in unrighteousness. He suppressed the truth. That is an active term. It is a very telling term. Kent Hughes explains it this way. He says, this suppression of the truth is not passive. It carries the idea of, uh, of holding something down. This is much like the boy who smuggled his dog into his room uh, to spend the night. When he heard his parents coming, he just put the dog in the toy box and sat on the lid, and then he tried to talk to his parents while ignoring the repeating, uh, repeated thumping of his poor pet. This is the idea of suppression. Here it is continual and aggressive striving against the truth. It is a willful turning of, uh, aside of that which is evident. Okay. According to verses 21, 22, and 23, this suppression is manifested in at least three or at least four different ways. Again, look at the text. Verse 21 states that for even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God. What this tells us is that people became irreligious. They did not honor Him. They did not glorify Him as God. And yet that is the chief of, end of man, is it not? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Did not the Apostle Paul tell us that whatever you say or do, do it all to the glory of God? That is our reason to exist. Because they have suppressed the truth, man has become irreligious. He has also become ungrateful. The very next, uh, very next phrase there tells us that they did not give thanks to God. This God causes the sun to shine. He makes the rain to fall. And yet men did not, they do not, Praise or thank the one who creates and sustains them. Even though every good and perfect gift comes down from above, they do not pause to express their appreciation or dependence on, on the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. They have then come, become altogether ungrateful. Not only that, but in, in the next verse we see that they have become untethered. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile, worthless in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. When man discounts God, when he removes Him from the equation, there is no more. 
They will go anywhere and say anything to get away from the implications of who he is. And that is not the problem of the imbecile. So the, the term that's used here for fool, it does not indicate an imbecile. Uh, someone who is mentally bereft. The word that's used here is moros. It, it refer, we, we use the term moron. But this is the individual who has knowledge, who has understanding, and yet in spite of all the evidence, in spite of all the things that, that, that can be known or are known by them, they act in complete contradiction to that. And so you have researchers and, and men like Christopher Hitchens or, or Richard Dawkins. Rather than assenting to the truth of God's existence, will make up the most wild and insane theories. Um, rather than viewing man as, as a product of God's creation, uh, coming to the fore and saying, well, that's not rational. Instead, proclaiming that man has been seated here by some sort of alien. They will say the wildest things. Professing to be wise, they become fools. Lastly, we see that because they have suppressed the truth, man has become idolatrous. They have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for the image, for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Idolatry is the natural response of, uh, of the man who has, again, disregarded God because he has to explain how, how things work how things come together. And so as we look at the ancient civilizations, we, we see them developing gods for this activity and that activity. There's the god of thunder, the god of lightning, the god of love, the god of crops, the god of fertility. And we have seen this, these gods, these deities, uh, re reflected in the most grotesque uh, of, of images. Half man, half beast all over the place. But this is what happens when the human mind is darkened to the truth of who God is. When they refuse to submit to that truth. And it's for these reasons that the wrath of God has been revealed against all unrighteousness and all the ungodliness of man. The one who has suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. So what shall we say to these things? I think there's a twofold implication for us. There's an implication that needs to be made to the unbeliever and one that needs to be made to the believer. For the unbeliever, it's this, is that there is no possibility of escape for them. That all mankind are children of wrath. We are all sons of disobedience, subject to God's righteous indignation. And so for them, there, there is no ability for you to, to stick your head in, in, in the sand and just to, to hope that things will pass you by and things will turn out okay. That is not the testimony of Scripture. So the unbeliever needs to know that they're in danger. They're in peril, both now and for all eternity, if they do not come to their creator. The implication for us as believers is that we must be about the task which God has called us to perform. The importance of this portion of Paul's letter really cannot be underestimated. Uh, if believers believe that all people everywhere deserve God's wrath and are under God's wrath, then it must motivate them to preach the gospel message. 
John MacArthur writes this. He says, throughout the history of the church, faithful men of God have understood and proclaimed the biblical truths that God is a God of justice and judgment, and that his wrath is against all unbelief and ungodliness. He says the knowledge, that knowledge was the great motivation for their tireless service in winning the lost. John Knox pleaded before God, give me Scotland or I die. As the young Hudson Taylor contemplated the fate of the unreached multitudes in China, he earnestly prayed, I feel that I cannot go on living unless I do something for China. Upon landing in India, Henry Martin said, here, I'm, here I am in the midst of heathen midnight and, and savage oppression. Now, my dear Lord, let me burn out for thee. Adoriam Judson, uh, the famed missionary of Burma, spent long, tiresome years translating the Bible for the people. He was eventually put into prison because of his work, and, and while he was there, his wife died. After being released, he contracted a serious disease that sapped what little energy he had left. Nevertheless, he prayed, Lord, let me finish my work. Spare me long enough. Spare me long enough to put the saving word into the hands of the people. James Chalmers, a, a Scottish missionary to the South, Island, South Sea Islands, was so burdened uh, for the loss that someone wrote of him. In, in Christ's service, he endured uh, hardness, hunger, shipwreck, and exhausting toil, and, and did it joyfully. He risked his life a thousand times and finally was clubbed to death, beheaded, and eaten by men, uh, by men whose friend he was and to whom he sought to enlighten Although he is unable to go overseas, Robert Arthington enabled countless others to go. By working hard and living frugally, he managed to give over 500,000 to the work of foreign missions. He testified, saying this, Gladly would I take the floor for my bed, a box for my chair, and another box my table, rather than that men should perish for want of the knowledge Christ. MacArthur concludes, he says, those saints, and there are many others like them, have clearly understood the wrath and judgment of God and the consequent horror of men dying without Christ. Without such understanding, there is no basis for evangelism. If men are not lost, hopeless, and incapable of glorifying God apart from Christ, there is no reason for them to be saved by him. That is our challenge. To understand the, the import of the text. That our brothers and sisters, our moms, our dads, our courage, our, uh, our cousins, uh, co-workers are lost within Christ. And in light of that, it is our duty, our responsibility, our privilege to share the life-saving message of the gospel. With you. May God give us the strength and the ability and the boldness to do that. Pray to Our great God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text and for this reminder. Father, each of us can think of our family members, friends, co-workers who are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And so, Father, we ask that as you give us boldness to speak to them, indeed, that you would give us boldness, that you would not, that you would not allow us to pass them by. But as we preach that message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and in Him alone, Father, that your word would take root in their hearts. That you would transfer them from the kingdom of darkness into the king of your glorious son. As the church would grow and expand, 
These people would be nurtured in the faith. That they would be excited about the new life that they have in your son. And Father, that they too might proclaim his excellencies to those around them. And so, Father, we ask for boldness. We ask for strength uh, to proclaim this word, this word in a, a dark and sinful way. We ask this for your honor and glory. We'll conclude this evening with a benediction from the book uh, of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for coming, brothers and sisters. We are dismissed.